<clears throat> Amen. We began to examine this morning wisdom for living. Wisdom for living. We began to examine the position of God's word on our relationships. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse number 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are become new. The word behold means to see. To see. The previous verse drives it home. Give me verse 16 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 16. <clears throat> Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yet though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Give me the amplified of verse 16. Amplified version. The Amplified says, consequently, from now on, we estimate and regard no one from a purely human point of view in terms of natural standards of value. No, even though we once did estimate Christ from a human viewpoint and as a man, yet now we have such knowledge of him that we know him no longer in terms of the flesh. So as you are, you have believed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by believing the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are now a new creature. You are now born again. You are now born of God. You are now a new creature or a new species, a new breed, a new race of being that never existed before. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24. Ephesians chapter 4 verse number 24. And put on the new man. Give me the King James. The new man. Put on the new man. Wherefore, verse 24. Ephesians 4 24. And that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Created. The new man is already created in righteousness and true holiness. So if there is true holiness, it means there is false holiness. But that's not our subject for today. True holiness. Give me the amplified of verse 24 of that same Ephesians chapter 4. The amplified now. And put on the new nature. The regenerate self. Created in God's image. God-like. In true holiness or true righteousness and holiness. So that scripture lets us know who the new creature is. So if you are born again, you are created in God. You are created like God. You are born of God. You are born after God. The Bible says all things are passed away. All things are become new. The new creation is a son of God. First John chapter 3 verse 1 and 2. King James Version. First John chapter 3 verse 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the father had bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Verse 2. Beloved. Now are we the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall be as he is. We shall see him as he is. So as a born again child of God, you are no longer a servant. You are a son. Galatians chapter 4 verse 6 and 7. Galatians chapter 4 verse 6 and 7. And because you are sons, God has set forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Next verse. Next verse. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So the believer is a son of God. He's a joint heir with Christ. He's an heir of God. Remember, not everybody is a son of God. In the first service, we saw that a man that is not born again is not a son of God. Therefore, he is naturally possessed by the devil. He is naturally possessed 
by the devil. And we read scriptures to establish that. So to be a son means you have believed the gospel. If you have not believed the gospel, you are called children of the devil or children of disobedience. A man that has not believed the gospel is called a child of the devil or a child of disobedience. That is, he is disobedient. Now, I'm not being abusive. I'm just being descriptive. He's a child of disobedience. John chapter 8 verse 44. John chapter 8 verse 44. Jesus speaking says, You are of your father the devil. And the loss of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. So when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. So the devil is the father of some people. Some people are called children of the devil. Why? Because they did not believe the gospel. But we are children of God because we have believed the gospel. John chapter 1 verse 12. But as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Next verse. Next verse. 617. For God God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Verse 18. He that believeth not on him is not condemned, but he that believeth, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So if you don't believe... You will be convicted and condemned. And you will be called a child of the devil. So that's not abusive but descriptive. So if you are not a Christian born of God, you are a child of the devil. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 to 3. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 to 3. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 2. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. Among whom also we all had our our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and we are by nature the children of wrath even as others so anyone that's not a child of god is a child of disobedience that's what the bible calls them in ephesians chapter 5 it tells us about us the new creation let me read from verse 1 to 4 ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 to 4 be therefore followers of God as their children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savour. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. You know comedians, comedians, we have a lot of them today. You discover that most of their jokes are not convenient. They are just foolish jesters. Foolish, that's what the Bible calls it. Foolish jesters. Foolish jestings. That's why you will never find the foot of any comedian on this pulpit. You will never find a comedian on this pulpit. Never. Not even in my dream. Which way would they used to get here? You will never find it. Why? We are not jesters. We are not jokers. We are not gathered here to laugh. We come for a serious matter. We are not tensed up that we are looking for somebody to make us relax. We are in rest. We are in rest. We have the joy of salvation. No comedy can produce that one. 
So I don't need a comedian to make me laugh. No, I have joy in the Holy Ghost. Can you see what is happening all over this hall right now? We don't need a comedian to stimulate us. We are naturally stimulated. What makes us joyful and happy is inside us. Our joy is not in things around. Our joy is in the salvation in Christ. He said rejoice not that demons are subject to you. But rather rejoice that your names are written well. So once we remember that our names are in the book of life. What comes out? Joy. Glory. Okay calm down first. Calm down. <laughs> Before we take the time and rejoice throughout. Let me finish teaching first. So our joy doesn't come from jokes. Our joy comes from the reality of what Christ has done on our inside. Am I communicating at all? No foolish jestings. When you laugh about sin, which is what the comedians do, they make you laugh about sin. You laugh about immorality. And as a Christian, such environment should be very uncomfortable. Such environment should be environments that stinks. Environments you cannot find conducive. Because that's not the Christian life. No foolish jesting. Because we are no fools. So we cannot give ourselves to foolishness. Are you understanding what I'm saying here? Yeah, we can't give ourselves to foolishness. Look at that same Ephesians. Let's read verse 5 and 6 of that same chapter. Ephesians chapter 5. For, for this you know, that no homemonger, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater, had any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Next verse. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things, cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 and 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 and 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor exhaustioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Look at me, everybody. God doesn't hate homosexuals, but God wants them to be saved. No homosexual has a part in the kingdom of God. And no lesbian has a part in the kingdom of God. And somebody says, where is homosexual? It's right there. Effeminate. Give me that verse 9. Verse 9. Verse 9. First Corinthians 6, 9. Give me the amplified version. First Corinthians 6, 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous and the wrongdoers will not inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, misled, neither the impure and immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor those who participate in homosexuality. See that? Those who participate in homosexuality. Next verse, amplified, verse 10. Nor cheats, swindlers, and thieves, nor greedy graspers, nor drunkards, nor foul-mouthed revilers, and slanderers, no extortioners and robbers will inherit or have any share in the kingdom of our God. The word effeminate is a word for homosexuals and lesbians. Homosexuals or lesbians or bisexuals or those that are given to bestiality. All of them fall under effeminate. And then look at verse 11 of that chapter. Verse 11, glory to God. Glory to God, verse 11. And such some of you were once, but you were washed, clean, purified by a complete atonement for sin, and made free from the guilt of sin. And you were consecrated, set apart, hallowed. And you were justified, pronounced righteous, by trusting in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit of our God. Such were some of you, but you are no more there. That's where you used to be. But the moment you got saved, you left that and became a child of God by nature. It's not Adam 
and Steve is Adam and Eve. It's not Eve and Evelyn. It's Adam and Eve. You can choose what you want to marry. But you do not determine the outcome of your choice. You can choose what you want to marry. But you do not determine the outcome of the choice. If the word of God makes you uncomfortable, it means you are not born again. If the word of God makes you uncomfortable, it means you are not born again. Because you are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the word of God. So you should be at home with the word of God, irrespective of who is uncomfortable. You should be at home with the word of God. Because you see, the word of God is foolishness to those who don't believe. To those who are perishing. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 verse 7. Ephesians chapter 5 verse number 7. <clears throat> be not ye therefore partakers with them. Verse 8. For you were sometimes darkness. But now are you light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. Verse 9. Glory to God. For the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Verse 10. Verse 10. Verse 10. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Verse 11. And have no fellowship. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. But rather reprove them. Where are the unfruitful works of darkness? In people. The unfruitful works of darkness is in people. In people. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. That is, the believer cannot be a close friend with an unbeliever. The believer cannot be an intimate friend of an unbeliever. It's not scriptural. The word teaches against it. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14. Please pay attention. 14 to 18. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement had the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God had said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Unbelievers, come out from among them. Them who? Them who do not believe the gospel. Come out means be distinct. Be separate. Come out. Be distinct. Be separate. That is, there's a sanctification we have in Christ. There is a sanctification we have in Christ. And there is a sanctification of our daily lives by the world. There is a sanctification we have in Christ. And there is a sanctification of our daily lives by the world. Where we are practically walking in the world. The more we learn, the more our steps are ordered and directed. The more we learn Christ, the more we learn the word, the more our steps are defined. The more we have a definition of where we can go and where we cannot go. So, the word of God becomes our sanctification on daily basis. Every day of our lives, we live a sanctified life practically by the word. Positionally, we are sanctified. But now, our daily walk in the world becomes our daily sanctification, our daily consecration. We live a consecrated life. Our hearts, our steps, our choices, our decisions, 
our relationships consecrated. Consecrated, Lord, today. Our moments and our days consecrated. We are sanctified positionally. Therefore, we cannot afford to live unsanctified in our daily lives. We practice our sanctification by the way we lead our lives. John 17, 17. <clears throat> Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So the word of God is given to us for our daily sanctification. As we go about life, as we go about choices, and as we go about relationship. That means you are living the sanctified life. Where you are distinctive, distinctively different. Where you are different from the world. You are among them, but you are not like them. You are among them, but you are different. Because you are living a life of sanctification. Some of us, we blend with the world easily. So that we are ashamed of who we are. When you meet unbelievers, you want to be like them because you don't want to be odd. You are not proud of who you are. So when you enter them, you blend. When you come among us, you blend. You have no position. You are not proud of your, of your parentage. You are not proud of your DNA. When you come among unbelievers, you don't want to stand out because they will laugh at you. And you cannot afford to be laughed at. So you compromise. You are a victim of identity crisis. You are suffering from personality defects. Personality defects. That's in your mind. You don't trust who you are. You are not sure of who you are. You are not proud of your DNA. You are not sure that you came out of a correct specimen. You are in doubt of the sperm that produced you. You don't believe that the sperm that produced you is original. You think that the sperm that produced you was mixed with water. You are not sure of your patrimony. Am I talking to somebody here? When you walk among people, you are not confident. You lack identity. So, you are a victim of identity crisis. But I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed to announce before the world, I'm a child of God. There is music I cannot listen to. There are magazines I cannot look at. There are books I cannot read. There are places I cannot sit in. There are movies I cannot watch. I can't watch it because it makes me uncomfortable. It's not because I can't watch it. I can watch it even better than you. But it makes me uncomfortable. Why discomfort myself on a vain thing like a movie? A figment of another man's adulterated imagination. The figment of a man's filthy thoughts scripted. Why should I pollute myself with it? Must I be entertained? If any man is merry, let him sing. So instead of looking for a movie to relax, relax in a song. And when I think that God is so not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my body gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sins. Then sing my soul. You just sing it and you are entertained. You are entertained in edification. You are in this world, but you are not of this world. So the things of this world must make you uncomfortable. Otherwise, your patrimony must be examined. I'm teaching good. I'm not ashamed that I'm a child of God. I'm not ashamed that I am holy. I'm not ashamed that I am righteous. 
if it makes me a Jew guy, by all means, I'm a Jew guy. If it makes me analog, by all means, I am analog. Why should I be digitalized in immorality? Why should I be digitalized in impurity? If it makes me unpopular, by all means. After all, if I was of the world, they will accept me. But because I'm not of the world, the world hates me. And Jesus said, if they hate me, they will hate you. Stay with me. Some of us compromise is easy. And we don't feel bad about it. How can light try to be darkness? What are you looking for in a fellow who doesn't believe that Christ died for our sins? What are you looking for in him? He says, come out. Come out from among them. And be ye separate. That is, be distinct. Let them call you names. Be separate. You cannot fellowship with an unsaved person. You cannot fellowship. The day you are comfortably fellowshipping with an unbeliever, you need to ask yourself questions. I remember a particular sister in my school days. An unbeliever approached her for marriage. She came back to me crying. Weeping. She wept. I said, why are you weeping? She said, Papa, what an insult. What an insult. What must I have done that gave an unbeliever the audacity to look me in the eye and tell me he wants to be my boyfriend? Papa, I'm, I mean, my brother, I must have done something. Oh, I feel bad that I could even by my attitude give an unbeliever the confidence to talk to me about relationship. She kept saying, Lord, I'm sorry. That is an unbeliever told her, be my girlfriend. And you, you are hanging out. You are hanging out. You are eating his money gradually. You are smiling. And you are calling it smartness. Something is fundamentally wrong. The lady said, I must have done so. Ah, an unbeliever is not afraid. He's not even afraid. You cannot share ideas. You cannot share thoughts. You cannot share a pattern and lifestyle with the unsaved. You cannot. Some of you use careless words. You call unbelievers your brother. Your brother. If an unbeliever is your brother, Satan is your father. You should love people. But you cannot share fellowship with people who are not Christians. You cannot. You will love them, pray for them, preach to them, help them. But you and them cannot share fellowship. The only mission you have in the life of an unbeliever is to preach the gospel to him or her. To the end that they are saved. The longer you stay with an unbeliever as a friend and you don't preach to the person, there's condemnation upon your life. The longer you and an unbeliever relate and you don't preach the gospel to that person, there's condemnation on your life. I'm not saying in your place of work. I'm talking about your friend who comes to your house always. And you have not found time to say, hello my friend, we are not from the same source. -so. Our parentage is different. And our destination differs. So we are not to have friendship with the world. James 4.4 4, Friendship with the world is enmity with God. 
First John 2 15. Love not the world, neither that things that are in the world. For all that is in the world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. So from the day you got born again, the unbeliever becomes darkness to you. Darkness. Our relationship with the unsaved is that they are darkness, we are light. They are darkness, we are light. Somebody shouted very loud, I am the light of the world. Can I hear you shout it one more time? Shout it for the last time. An unbeliever is not your brother. We can be neighbors. We can be blood brothers. We can be colleagues. But we are not brothers. My brothers are in Christ. My brothers are in Christ. So, there's no way I can marry an unbeliever. Fact, it should not even be considered. There's no way I can marry an unbeliever. There's no way I can be in a serious relationship with an unbeliever towards marriage. How can a non-Christian like you? How? How can a non-believer, a non-Christian, how can he like you? Does Satan like you? I'm going to hear the sisters. He's a cool guy. He understands me. He was there for me. He was there when my father died. You are just accepting to join your father soon. No one understands me like him. All the brothers in church are too spiritual. I like guys that are cool. All the brothers in church, it's either prayer meeting, Bible study, no relaxation. I like guys that are balanced. Church brothers are too serious. It shows what an unserious human being you two are. When prayer, when you are allergic to prayer, and you're allergic to Bible study. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. If you're truly born of God, the seed is incorruptible. But when your own is being corrupted, mm -mm. I won't say it. I like him. You know, when, when I used to do counseling for marriage, I heard things in this life. I like him. I will save him. Savior, Savior. Listen, sister. There's no basis for it. If you like, let your heart jump out and fall on the floor. There's no basis for it. I told one sister, you cannot marry him. She said, Papa, the more you're saying it, my blood pressure is rising. My heart is beating fast. I said, let it beat faster so that the matter will end. You cannot marry him because he's not born again. Papa, he is better than born again believers. Ah! You are gone. You're not gone with the wind. You are gone. You're totally gone. You're, there's no hope for you. You're gone. When an unbeliever is better than brothers in Christ, it means you're not part of us. You're just a pretender. This small thing called marriage has exposed you. It's not even antichrist that exposed you. It's marriage. You cannot be in a relationship with an unbeliever. Whether you are a male or a female. You are now a new creation. You know, under the Old Testament, the Jews could not marry a Gentile. You know that. Why? Because God was teaching them identity. No Jewish person was permitted to marry a Gentile. 
You are a new creation. You can only marry from your tribe. The tribe of believers. The tribe of the born again. 1 Corinthians 7.39 Pay attention now. <clears> 1 <throat> Corinthians 7.39 The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the law. Only in the Lord. He gives you the right to marry whomsoever you will. But only in the Lord. You cannot marry outside Christ Jesus. The new creation cannot marry, should not marry outside the church. You cannot keep friends with the world. You cannot have close companionship with the world. Beside the fact that it is clear in the word of God that there is no basis for such relationship. It will have an effect on you. 1 Corinthians 15.33 1 Corinthians 15.33 Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Be not deceived means it's not impossible to be deceived. Evil communication, there is evil company. Someone says, Pastor, I'm a socialist. I socialize so easily. <laughs> Sister, socialize among brethren. Socialize where? Among brethren. That's the word of God. Are we not to relate with the world? I didn't say that. He says friendship, companionship, intimate relationships must not be constituted with the world. It's not that you will hate people. If anybody hears the gospel and does not believe the gospel, is a child of disobedience. What is at work in that person is the spirit of the world. The spirit of antichrist which is against the word of God. The spirit of antichrist, which is against the knowledge of the word. If you keep that alliance, it will influence you. It will influence your opinion and it will influence how you reason and how you think. So we have said two things. Number one, no marriage between the believer and the unbeliever. Number two, there is no close companionship between the believer and unbeliever. When I said yes to Jesus, I said bye-bye to the world. Goodbye world. Stand no longer with you. Goodbye pleasures of sin. Stand no longer with you. I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. Goodbye, wall. Goodbye. Goodbye. There's no attraction there. The attraction dies once you see the riches in Christ. Moses forsook Egypt, esteeming the riches of Christ, greater riches than the pleasures of sin. He forsook. He forsook. Galatians chapter 6 verse 14. He says the world is crucified to me. Galatians 6 14. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. 1 John 5 4. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. I have overcome the world. I am not of this world. I thought somebody would shout that. That is salvation. Salvation means I am no more of this world. Now, of course, in the first service, I dealt with the difference between the world and things. So you need to get the message of the first service. Because that's where we lay the foundation for all that I'm teaching. And because this subject is very critical, I'm taking my time to deal with issues. So the question is, are there instances... Where these things can happen, 
Well, sometimes people are already married before they come into Christ. They are married as unbelievers. So unbeliever, unbeliever got married. Then one of them got born again. Does it mean that when a man is now born again and his wife refuses to be born again, he should send her away? No. 1 Corinthians 7, 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 12. <clears throat> but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. Next verse. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Next verse. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. So in black and white, Brother Paul says, you don't put your partner away because you got born again. Peter was married before he met Jesus. Peter was. He teaches here what you should not, that you should not put away your marriage based on your faith. If the other party be pleased to dwell with you. So we can have as believers an unbeliever in marriage. If one of them contracted the marriage before he or she got saved. But there's no basis after salvation for a believer to marry an unbeliever. No basis whatsoever. First Peter chapter 3 verse 1 gives further credence to what I'm saying here. Brother Peter, likewise you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. That if any obey not the word, they also may without the word. Be won by the conversation of their wives. So there's a situation where two unbelievers got married and one of them got born again and still stays with the unbelieving one. Very clear in scripture. Brother Paul said, don't put her away if she wants to stay. Don't put him away if he wants to stay. But if he decides to go, we will deal with that in the weeks to come. But there's no basis for for after salvation relationship with someone who does not believe. Alright? So, there are instances where after the marriage, the wife or husband receives the gospel. And we have it clearly spelled out in scripture. But this is not for you who is a single person. You're already born again. Don't say, okay, I'm no more born again. After I marry, I'll be born again. You're a joke. It will be a joke to think like that. So, open your eye wide. Don't enter a relationship with someone that is not born again. If you do that, you are living in disobedience. Notice, the success of your marriage, listen, everybody listen carefully. Everybody all over, all over the world. Listen to me. The success of your marriage has nothing to do with your enjoying it. Your first target in getting married or in succeeding in marriage is not you enjoying it. It is whether it brings glory to God. It is whether it brings glory to God. And there's no way you marrying an unbeliever can bring glory to God. Enjoying it is not the primary thing. The primary thing is, does this relationship give glory to Jesus? Because it's no longer I that lives. I'm dead. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So therefore, my choices and decisions, firstly, primarily, must bring glory to Jesus. The guy takes care of me. Every holiday I'm in Paris. Every holiday I'm in Dubai. That's not fulfillment in Christ. That's not fulfillment in Christ. What brings fulfillment is the fact that what you're doing is of glory to Jesus. What is of fulfillment is the fact that this relationship, this marriage, ultimately is of glory to Jesus. Number two. What other relationships can we have before we got saved? 
unsaved parents. Unsaved parents. Parents. It's not a relationship you went to after you became a Christian. You didn't become a son of your parents after you were born again. No. Assuming there was a way to choose parents after salvation, you should not choose unbelieving parents. Assuming there was a way to choose parents after salvation, you should not choose unbelieving parents. But because you already have a relationship with a man and a woman and they gave birth to you, they trained you, they raised you up, they nurtured you, they've been a blessing to your life. You thank them for that. So there are relationships that stay with us even after salvation, like this one I have just mentioned. Now, we talked about marriage, we have talked about parents. We didn't enter into these relationships as Christians. Parents, we were born into their home. Whatever faith they were of, even if they were not believers in God, they gave birth to us. What about employment? What about employment? Employment is not friendship. Employment is not marriage. And employment has nothing to do with relationships that were referred to in these scriptures. However, as you are in the workplace, because there are people you see all the time, there will be temptation to develop intimate relationship. Because you see them every day. You talk to them all the time. Sometimes you get into trouble together and you navigate how to come out of trouble together. So there is a temptation to build intimate relationship with your colleagues at work. And that's where many of us don't know where to draw the line. We don't know where to draw the line. We just fall in line, hook, sink, and everything. That fellow who employed you is your boss. B-O-S-S. He's your boss. And he should end there. That fellow in your office is just your colleague at work. And he should end there. You must not step beyond the boundaries of that relationship. You must sit down and properly situate what relationship you can have with your boss and where it ends within the definition of your job. Same thing with your colleagues in your place of work. Teaching good? Many children of God get jobs in very good corporations, whether here or outside the country. Before you know it, they begin to act like those people in their office. They start talking like them. You know? Start talking like them. They start thinking worldly. They start looking at the church through the lenses of the world. And they start expecting that the church will function like that. How can I go to a church where there is no charity? After all, bottom line, Christianity is about giving and helping the poor. Who told you that? Where did you hear that from? You are beginning to conform. You are not being transformed. You are conforming. You are spending too much time with only nude minds. You are spending too much time with the, with the spirit of the world. So you are beginning to imbibe. You have gone into Canaan without the mentality of an Israelite. So the, the way of Canaan is beginning to influence you. And now you're using the binoculars of the secular to look at the church. You are thinking like a man that belongs to this world. And under pressure, that's why a lot of brothers, and I'm glad many of them are watching me online, a lot of our brothers who went out of the country to go in search of jobs, they, they lost their way. They just entered bush. They're inside bush. All of them are moving in the bush. It's gradually when they start seeing light, they start coming out of the bush. Why? Because they get swallowed by the world system. You see somebody that was very dedicated and learning the way of Christ and growing the knowledge of Christ. He leaves the country, goes to another country, he starts doing four jobs. Four jobs will not allow him to read his Bible once in three months. He can't even pray 30 minutes in one year. Because he's chasing after dollars, chasing after pounds. And he keeps chasing and the money keeps running very fast. And his legs are too slow. 
So, he starts owing left, right, center. Mortgage leg, mortgage hand, mortgage his eyes, mortgage his mind. The only thing he has not mortgaged is his spirit. So they are lost. They've adapted. The world has consumed them. And even some of us, not only those who go abroad, some of us get too secular. Too secular. In pursuit of things that when you leave this world, you leave them here. They are no more thinking Christ. They are lost. Everyone is a product of influence. Everyone is a product of influence. When you step beyond boundaries, you start relating with people that will influence you negatively. And over the years, your thinking changes. You are no more able to draw the line. Some of us over the years, our mindsets change. Because we don't know where to draw the line in our relationships. There is nothing you are doing today that somebody did not influence you. There is nothing you are doing today that didn't come from an influence somewhere. Someone says, I make up my mind. I do what I want to do. That statement is influenced. I make up my mind. I do what I want to do. Somebody influence him to say it. Everybody is a product of influence. So you have to keep the right influence around you. And we will deal with how to handle these relationships. You know, many of us forget that we're still in the world. And the world hates the word. The world hates the word. W-O-R-D. Some of us are afraid to look like fanatics you know we are afraid we are afraid to look like fanatics but unbelievers are fanatics of their unbelieving they are fanatical about it they sing it in their songs they they they, they, they carry it in their walking steps they carry it in their dressing they carry it in their way of talking they are fanatical about the world's way of doing things then a believer is economical economical instead he compromises with them to tap into their dressing Tap into their way of talking. Tap so that at least it won't be too different. You are embarrassed to be a believer. You see a child of God wearing a skirt that you are almost naked. Where did you get that from? Certainly not from Christ. A skirt that makes you almost naked. Defeating the purpose for wearing clothes. Where did you get that from? Where did you get that from? Or you wear clothes where your internals are transparent. Where you, what? That's not the spirit of Christ. That's not the spirit of Christ. It's a worldly spirit. It's a spirit of this world. It's not of Christ. You are under an influence. Somebody is manipulating you like a remote control. You have entered into an influence where you are forced to act in certain ways and behave certain ways even though you know that that's not your comfort zone. I'm teaching good here. Please pay attention. Change their dressing because they think what they are wearing is old fashioned. How do you know dressing well clothed is old fashioned to the world. You know that? To, for a woman to dress and cover her nakedness well is old fashioned. The world doesn't like that. And they won't celebrate that. The world wants you to be as naked as possible. As naked as possible. If a lady now snaps a picture with her pant and brazier, she will have a million likes. If a woman dresses full from head to leg, she will have one like. <laughs> and that one like is her husband or her father or her mother. Or not him like her. <laughs> to avoid too much shame. So he liking him by himself. If I'm teaching good, say I hear you. Don't be depressed. Harassed abuse 
by Facebook likes. They don't like you. You are a fool. Moo moo. Your mother wasted her school fees on your head. If your approval is likes on Facebook, you are a waste of resources. I'm teaching good. Can't you see that the world wants women to be as naked as possible? That's the spirit of the world. It's not the spirit of God. You are not of the world. They hate you. There's nothing you will do to please them. They still hate you. So you can as well accept your identity and stay where Christ has kept you and enjoy the life that is yours in Christ. If I'm teaching, say I hear you. Don't let them design our fashion. Don't let them. Design your dressing to glorify Jesus. Because that's what we live for. Papa, are you saying we should dress like grandmothers? No, did I say that? I just said make sure you are covered. Don't show us your nakedness. It's only when food is exposed that flies will feast on it. Once you open food, flies will feast. But if food is covered, those flies are not born. The word is enough for the wise. The only people that open food are tracks is flies. And flies like it. Just keep the food open. We will gather there. We will urinate there. And we will pick as much as we can pick. And after flies are finished, ants will come. All of them will gather. Where food is unprotected. <laughs> Teaching good? That's a parable of the elders. <laughs> Say it very loud. I am not of this world. You know, if you keep seeing people all the time and you talk with them always, before you know it, you start talking like them. Is that true? The people that you spend most of your time with influence your speech. The new creation must know how the world teaches him to deal with each kind of these relationships the word of god is the wisdom of god james chapter 1 verse 5 says if any man lack wisdom let him ask of god that give it to all men liberally so you must ask the father how do i go about things in this place you know there's a strange verse i'm going to read before i close where jesus said some things that will help us Jesus said, Father, I have not asked you to take them away from the world, but keep them from the evil one. How does God keep us from the evil one? By the word. By the word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So it's by the word of God that we live a sanctified life among people. It is the word of God that keeps us sanctified in that context among people. Look at Matthew chapter 10 verse 16. Matthew chapter 10 verse number 16. <clears throat> Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Wise as serpents. And harmless as those. We are in the midst of wolves. That's where we are. This reminds me of numbers. The very set of people sent to spy. That land is theirs. But the activity in that land is not theirs. The promised land God gave to them. But the activities in the promised land were not theirs. The Bible says Moses sent them to spy. To go and look at what was there. He didn't send them to look at the behavior of the people. Because the people's behavior did not belong to them. But to see the things that God had provided for them. What does it mean? In this world, we are pilgrims. We are spies. 
We are spies. We are pilgrims in this world. We don't belong here. Here, we have no continuing city. We don't belong here. We are strangers. We are pilgrims in this world. We are not to adapt or adopt people's culture or behavior. You know, some people come to church. When they come to Christ, they say, eh, you know, the way you people are doing things in the ministry does not agree with our culture. What? The day you receive Christ, that your natural culture was, was ended. You don't come with your culture to Christ. Mm -mm. In Christ, we have our culture. Are you hearing me? Because in Power City, we have Americans. We have Brazilians. We have Tanzanians. We have South Africans. We have Ghanaians. We have Canadians. We have Europeans. We have uh, Africans. We have Ghanaians. We have uh, eh? Nigerians. We have Indians. And each of these people have their culture. But once you enter Christ, you throw it away and blend. The word of God becomes our culture. Don't bring your culture here. Don't bring it here. It will not be tolerated. It will not. Yeah. So that you don't make us to be serving your culture. To be worshipping your culture. No. We are here to worship Christ. Not to worship your culture. And don't bring your culture here. The dividing line here for culture is the word of God. What the word of God does not teach, we don't do it. And if the word of God says it, even if your culture does not accept it, we stay with the word of God. Say with me very loud, the word of God is final authority in my life. Say it one more time and know what you're talking about. Now shout it, let the devil hear you very loud and clear. So when you come here, you throw away your culture and stay with the word of God. The word of God forms our culture. Am I talking to somebody here? The word of God forms our culture. That's why when I stand on this pulpit, I don't give you stories. I give you the word of God. Scripture upon scripture upon scripture. That's our culture. That's final authority. The land is theirs. But the activity in that land was in theirs. In this world, we are pilgrims. We are to be industry. You know, we are to be, to, to, to be pilgrims in our industries. Whether it's medical field, banking industry, financial industries, wherever you're working. In those industries, we are spies to see the things that our father has created for us. So as spies, we are not to adopt to their behavior. We are not to adopt to their culture. We are not to adopt to the thinking pattern of the unsaved people. We are to think from the world. We are to function in the word of God. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. But we have been sent into the world to preach the gospel. Am I teaching good? And while we are doing that, Bible tells us that we are like sheep in the midst of wolves. We have to be wise. We have to be gentle. The wisdom of God is the word of God. We have to know what the word of God says. We have to practice the word of God in our profession, on our streets, and in every relationship that we keep. When God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he told Lot, get out of that land. And Lot's wife became a permanent ingredient in our pot of soup. If you didn't get that, it wasn't meant for you. I mean, this world, but not of this world. She looked back at the things of this world. My relationships with the world, I must be very careful. Because the world is governed by the devil. How can you as a Christian grow spiritually when what you listen to most of the times are the things of this world? Every time you listen to music, they are things of this world. 
you know, secular music. That's all you play all the time. Bam, 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 bam. I, I, you know, when I hear this music, they say, what is doing in my body? You are adapting. You are adapting. Very soon we'll be looking, you know, be looking at you and wondering what has become of you. You are sanctified because you are in Christ. But you, you can't be living a sanctified life and adapt with the world. A friend of the world is an enemy of God. You know, Brother Hagin, Kenneth Hagin said, we must treat the things of this world with care because there's a spirit in the things of this world. There's a spirit at work in the things of this world. Everything that this world offers you, there's a spirit at work in it. Every comedy, every music, every movie, all of them, there's a spirit. Are we together? There's a spirit. There's a spirit. <laughs> there's a spirit. And the world people know how to get it across. They package the movies, they package the music in ways where they're able to communicate their ideology. Communicate what? I'm not hearing you. There's an ideology behind all of this. There's an ideology. And don't be gullible. You must know that you are in a system that hates you. Keep your life, keep your house pure. Keep yourself pure. If you then be risen with Christ, hallelujah. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Hallelujah. For my life is dead, but is hid with Christ in God. Seek those things that are above. Seek them. Let that be your pursuit. Let that be your appetite, the things that are above. The things of God. Prayer. Fellowship. You know, worship. Study of God's word. Evangelism. Making disciples. Let that be your pursuit. If you then be risen with Christ. Those, those should be your pursuit. That should define the relationships you keep and the relationships you have. Stand on your feet. That's all I got for you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Somebody blessed. Say, I am not of this world. Say, I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. Say it very loud. I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. Say, in the name of Jesus, I am not comfortable with the spirit of this world. I have zero tolerance for the spirit of this world. I discern the spirit of this world and I refuse. Say it loud. I refuse. Say it louder. I refuse to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. I am light. Darkness cannot be comfortable where I am. Therefore, as light, I shine my light before men so they see my good works and glorify my father which is in heaven. I didn't hear a powerful amen. Say, so let us walk in the light as he is in the light. For he that walketh in the light has no occasion of stumbling. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So let's walk in the light. Let's stay in the light. Let's speak in the light. Let's dress in the light. Let's relate in the light. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. Let me ask all of you a question. Can you relate with an unbeliever in the light? No, answer me now. Can you relate with an unbeliever in the light? Why? It's darkness. No matter how much you bring light to darkness, the man is darkness. You can only relate light with light. In case you are here, you've been thinking of marrying an unbeliever. Go and stop that nonsense. What did I say? Shout it very loud. What did I say? Stop that nonsense. Say, you know she's from a very rich family. See the poverty from your village that is following you. Marrying a woman for her wealth is the height of stupidity. That means you have accepted that you are a slave. Self-imposed slave. Or marrying his, a man because of his wealth. 
you are not in marriage. You are in business. You are a business person. Are you understanding? If you are eyeing the money, and that's why you are saying yes, hey, that same money will kick you out. I have seen something with these eyes. Don't marry because of money. Don't marry because of any of those things. Marry because you have found somebody that you can serve the purpose of God together with. If what joins you is the purpose of God, when money is not there, you will still be going. When money is there, you will still be going. Am I talking to somebody here? That's why mama married me. This boy was very poor. Very poor. This boy was very poor. I even wonder why she agreed. Even me, I surprised. <laughs> No, I'm serious. It shocked me till now. <laughs> this is me. <laughs> I'm telling you, it surprised me up till today. Because the only thing I had apart from poverty Because I'm hearing myself, you're laughing now. When I was talking, oh, you didn't laugh. Oh. The only thing I had apart from poverty, and I'm not joking, God is my witness, was the purpose of God for my life. The only thing I had to show was ministry. Finish, oh, ministry. This ministry I'm still doing was all I had that she was saying yes to. That purpose of God. Because she too had a purpose. She wanted somebody to fulfill it with. And that's why we've come through thick and thin. We've come through challenges, turbulence. We've come through rough times and smooth times, happy times, sad times, joyful times, challenging times. And we're just there like glued eternally. Because what brought us together is still there. If you marry a man for good times, when bad times come, it will end the marriage. Because life is an adventure in good and bad times. That's what life is. Life is an adventure in good and bad times. Billionaires become poor. Poor people become billionaires. Life is unstable. Bible calls money uncertain riches. So you don't marry for wealth. You marry for purpose. Are you hearing what I'm saying? In fact, let me shock you one more. You don't marry for beauty. If you marry for beauty, beauty is vain. That is, after a while, beauty will be empty. Because if you marry a woman for beauty, and a heavy misunderstanding comes where you cannot agree, suddenly she's no more beautiful. You will even be wondering, what did I see? What? But if it's for purpose, after all is done, you look back at why we came. It is still alive. You keep the journey going. I'm teaching good. Don't worry, we shall enter marriage. If you are a husband here and you, you, you leave your wife at home next Sunday first service, now you do yourself. I'm not saying you should come to first service because I don't have where to keep all of you. But what I'm saying is the moment first service starts, go to Facebook, go to YouTube, only say, honey, come, 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 sit down. Bring a cup of tea, milk with a drink. First and second service. Next Sunday. Because I'm going to settle down on husband and wife. But when is there going to be another one? Because we're going to start entering into all of those quarters. See, I'm teaching you all this because I don't want to do counseling. <laughs> I don't want to be doing counseling. So let me counsel you. Exactly. Let me settle all the matters. Say, I hear you. Because knowledge and understanding shall be the stability of your times. So that you can have a stable life. With armed with knowledge and understanding. See, I hear you. Yeah. Have a stable life. You won't fail. You won't fail. Somebody say, I hear you. 
And if you know marriages and relationships, friends of yours that are struggling with their relationships, ask them to connect. Ask them to tune in. Even today, ask them to go and watch what I taught first and second. Because this foundation will set the pace for everything I'll be saying. Are you blessed? Are you excited? Say, I'm not of this world. I have the spirit of God. I'm born of God. I'm a child of God. I am the light of this world. Therefore, my light continues to shine. In Jesus' name. Lift your right hand, Father. I pray for everybody in this service, those online, on television, on radio. I thank you for grace that abounds over this family. Thank you that revelation knowledge keeps growing. Everyone connected online, on radio, on television. The grace of Jesus is multiplied upon your life. I decree that in the name of Jesus, you grow in knowledge, you grow in revelation. I decree that the enemy has no occasion of interfering with what God has done in your life. In the name of Jesus. I decree right now every ungodly appetite that is trying to develop inside you it withers in the name of Jesus every unrighteous appetite that is trying to find expression on your inside withers from the root in the name of Jesus every ungodly alliance is broken in the name of Jesus every ungodly friendship and relationship is terminated in the name of Jesus and I decree that by the finished work of Christ you are sanctified you are set apart. You are sanctified. You are set apart for God's purpose. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. I pray that relationships here that are of God that have been struggling, that through these teachings, your people will come to a place of stability. Thank you for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of final letter. Are you blessed this morning? I want to take up your... Your, wash, your honor offering, the offering you give in honor for the word of God. And I'd like you to un package it quickly. When we give, we give in honor. We give us a se sense of responsibility, a sign of maturity and growth. A, a sign that we have matured to a place where we're embarking on the responsibilities that are ours in the advancement of our father's kingdom on the earth. And then also today is partnership service. So I want to quickly pray for all the online partners all the campus partners around the world and all the radio partners, everybody who partners with us, I want to pray for you right now. Remember that partnership gives you an opportunity as a responsible child of God who have discovered the riches of God's grace, who has discovered the unsearchable riches of God's grace, the mercy of God, who have discovered what Christ has done for you that you cannot afford. And you have decided to partner with Christ in taking his saving message to the ends of the world. That's what partnership does. And this you do every month through your finances. Where you deliberately set apart a particular chunk of your monies. Where you honor Christ with it by supporting us. So that we can do all that we do on television, radio, online and around the world. And every time you do this. I want you to know that you are laying up for yourself treasures in heaven. You're laying them up. Brother Paul says, my crown and rejoicing are the souls that are won. When you give us money and we get the gospel out and people are changed, people are blessed, lives are saved, people's lives are turned around, you become a partaker of, their, of that reward through your giving. And if you're watching online, you're not a partner yet, and you want to partner with us from this month for the next 12 months, all you need to do today is send a mail to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. We'll be glad to send you all the details for partnership. And we want to thank you for your willingness to partner and support us so together jointly we can get this gospel to the ends of the earth. There's not one single person that can fulfill the mandate. Not one. It takes a whole team of people to get this gospel to the ends of the earth. I want to pray for all the partners around the world. Father, we pray for all the partners all over the world, online, on television, on radio, those that are watching right now in the campuses, all our partners who partner with this ministry every month through their finances, sacrificially, to see to it that this gospel continues to change lives and continues to reach the ends of the earth. I pray for all the partners today 
that in the name of Jesus, my God supplies all your needs according to his riches in glory. I decree that you are enriched in all things. Every partner of this ministry, I speak the favor of God over you. I speak direction. I decree that you have opportunities, ideas, concepts, insights. I decree that your needs are met. I decree that everything that you are believing God for is released right now. Receive the favor of God. Receive protection. Receive preservation. I decree that you be robust in health. You are kept by the power of God. You are far from oppression. No weapon of the enemy prospers against you. Throughout this month, you will make progress. You will advance in your career. You will advance in your businesses. In the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father, for answered prayer over all our partners around the world. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. amen. All right, so partners, you can go ahead, send all your partnership commitments. The banking details are scrolling and uh, all over the various platforms. We love you and we're glad you're a part of this. I'll be joining Mr. Michael Bush in the next two minutes for Ask the Counselor in the next two minutes. But before then, lift up your offerings. We want to pray. And just honor Jesus for the word we have had today. Father, thank you for everyone giving an honor offering to honor the finished work of Christ this afternoon. Our givings are an expression of our gratitude and worship as we honor your word. And we ask the blessing upon everyone giving today. And we decree that needs are met supernaturally. Thank you for the peace that passes all understanding. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. Online family, television, radio. I'll be joining Mr. Michael Bush. But remember, Monday, Tuesday, we continue teaching you in the evenings, Monday, Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, I'll be back here to teach live on relationships, wisdom for living. You don't want to miss the midweek service for anything. Get more people to be part of it. And you know we love you guys. Thank you for supporting. Thank you for sending all of your offerings to help us do the things we do for the kingdom. Remember to register for Power Bible School. And remember to register for Homecoming 2021 right here at Power City. All the info are on my Facebook page. You can go there, get details. You can call the numbers for more information. We love you guys. Looking forward to seeing Ask the Counselor. And looking forward to connect with you live on Wednesday at 6 p.m. GMT plus one. And until then, enjoy the grace of Christ. Let's celebrate viewers around the world for being a part of this service this morning. Glory! Amen! Woo! Glory to God forevermore. Amen and amen. Hit it! Let's do it as we give. Any for these, all the messages and books by Dr. Abel Damina. Please call plus 234-806-800. 9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com um, Give the account details out to those who might need them. Power City International is the account name. There are three banks. There's FCMB, there is uh, Zenith, and there is UBA. I'll start on this edition of the program with FCMB 2982-68-2028. That's for FCMB, Power City International. Zenith is bank number 2, 10, 12, 36, 5, 12. 10, 12, 36, Zenith Bank, Steel Power City International. And finally, UBA 139, 26, 465 UBA 139 26 465 Power City International for sponsorship. You need to support the program, you need to sponsor what we do, especially on the other mega platforms coming up soon. Call plus 234 803 275 6104 or email Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. The doctor there is GR. Okay, so at this point, I just need to tell you my name is Michael Bush, I'm the anchor, the production team all join me to also formally introduce Global Baba, the international televangelist, prolific author. He writes and teaches like no one else does. And see how he's standing there. He's just standing there as if uh, he's not the one. Help me welcome Global Baba, Dr. Abel Damina. The Intercontinental, Mr. Bush. Good to see you, Global Baba. So good to see you today. Global Baba. Wow, you look so, good. So Global Baba, the fashionista. No, but have you looked at your jackets? Have you looked at your jackets? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Okay, Global but let's open with prayers, as we always do. Prayers for Aquaibum, prayers for our government and people, prayers for our country, 
and of course prayer for, for our world. Let's pray together. Father, we rejoice that we have the privilege to declare before your word today the things that concerns our peace and concerns the advancement of your kingdom in our time. Thank you for Kwaibom State. Thank you for the governor, his cabinet, and all of the public servants that continue to serve us every day. We declare that you keep them, preserve them, meet all their needs, and continually help them to fulfill the purpose for which they are in office. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We pray for our nation and other nations of the world. We decree that the word of the Lord continues to prevail and reign and that the purpose of God continually finds expression. Thank you that the gospel advances, souls are saved, disciples are, are raised and all over the world. Preachers of the true gospel are rising everywhere. And we rejoice that our prayers are answered right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. And it's coming from a mindset that believes that God sets the trap, you fall in the trap, he punishes you. It's a very ungodly mindset. But how can a pastor think like oh, that? Oh, he's not the only one. There are many of them. It's a whole school of thought. It's a whole school of thought. They believe that God is behind evil. They believe that God uses evil to punish his children. They believe all sorts. You know, and all of that, they call it the justice of God. But look at the justice of God. Romans chapter 5 verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That's the justice of God. Global Baba. The Intercontinental. Okay, two more anonymous texts, then we uh, find a way to some far-flung continent of the world, and that will be Australia or Oceania. We'll be going there in a moment. This anonymous entry, hello, Global Baba, I need your counsel on how to go about a disciple that is addicted to porn. He has been on it for more than seven years, sir. Whenever he tries to stop it, he always finds himself in it again. He has made so many promises to himself to stop, but he couldn't. He even fasted because of this addiction, but all to know Abel, blah, 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 blah. what should I help him do? Well, if you have somebody, a disciple who is addicted to porn, put less emphasis on the porn. Don't make the porn an issue. Make him hearing the word an issue. If he keeps hearing the word, after a while, the word will change his appetite. When his appetite is changed, the desire for porn will die. On his own, he will walk out of it. But if you make the porn an issue, you will torment him and torment him, and he doesn't have what it takes to be free from it. So look at this. We all with open face, beholding the glory of God as in a mirror, we are changed into that same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit. So the Spirit of God does the work when the man focuses on Christ. Ultimately, it is Christ that brings the change. Okay. Our last anonymous entry on this edition of the program. Hello, Global Baba. May you please explain to me in details the counsel of God according to Psalms 81.1. Is this more like the board of directors? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's thinking like a natural man. The counsel of God simply means the entire plan, purpose, the, 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 the program of God. And the counsel of God is salvation. Okay. That's the whole counsel of God. God's whole plan. You think counsel? Yes, that counsel, counsel is God's counsel. Oh. 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 Oh, global Baba. <laughs> so that counsel is it, God's counsel. The counsel of God. Oh, my. That is what, what is God's intended plan. Man. What is God cooking to carry out? The only thing God is, has been cooking from the beginning of time is to save man. Okay. Global Baba, you know, just about um, five seconds, 10, 15 marks, seconds back in time, you answered a question that I think that same answer would hold for this man. All the way in Australia and Oceania, that's almost like the end of the world. Yeah. Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Dr. Damina. My name is Janice Garrido. I am from the island of Guam, located in the Mariana Islands in the Pacific. For students of geography, Guam is the largest island in Micronesia. Okay, so I've been following your teachings and Sunday services for some time now, sir. 
I would really like to purchase your teachings and DVDs and reading materials if possible. I also want to be mentored by you to be equipped and so I can in turn equip the next generation. Please let me know how I can order, pay, and receive your teachings. Thank you. Also, I need counseling on how to handle a situation. I learned recently that my granddaughter has chosen lesbianism. At first, I was very disappointed with her and started reminding her of how it was an abomination in the eyes of God and that she should have known better than to give in to this evil. She subsequently distanced herself from me. She's my eldest granddaughter, Dr. Damina. I love my granddaughter and I miss her. How can I love her and not offend God at the same time? How do I love her and welcome her to my home and back into my life without offending God? How can I preach and remind her of her sinful ways? Please help me to approach her and love her the way Jesus would. Maybe I could call to reconcile, being that it's a new year and a new beginnings. Janice Garrido in the island of wow. Guam. Well, Janice, well, what you do is, first of all, our office reach out to you on materials, how to get them and all of that, and they will be shipped to wherever you are in Australia. Now, secondly, what do you do with your daughter? Uh, the first thing to do is to call her and, re and reconcile, apologize to her. You know, it's, it's true that as a parent, it's heartbreaking for you to see your daughter getting involved with another woman, you know, and uh, all of that. But remember that lesbianism is not more than lies and stealing. Sin is sin. What she has done is not uh, the unpardonable sin. It's still one of the sins that human beings get involved with. So look at it like that and pull her back in. Love her. Don't talk about the lesbianism. Just love on her. You know, show her as much love as possible. Tell her how much God loves her. Tell her how much God accepts her. Tell her what Jesus has done for her. Tell her what Jesus is to her. Who Jesus is to her. Tell her that even no matter what she has done, she is loved and accepted. Preach the gospel of salvation. Get her born again. And then just open her up to the teaching of God's word. What is happening to your daughter is she's suffering from identity crisis. She doesn't know who she is. So as you reveal Christ to her and as she begins to see Christ and his love, suddenly she will realize who she is. And she will rise up like the prodigal son and say to herself, I'm bigger than this. And walk away from it. That's what you should do. Love on her, call her. Remember, it's the love of God that leads us. To repentance so when you demonstrate that love on her it will make it easy for her to embrace god's love and to embrace the gospel fantastic Yo, Baba. right now back in the live church here back in the live audience mr kevin festus mba sent in a question global baba i want to know the difference between the holy ghost and the spirit of god you said there was no Holy Ghost in the Old Testament, but there was Spirit of God. What was the work of the Spirit of God, if not the same as the Holy Ghost? Please, can you expatiate? All right, yeah, the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God. So this is what it was. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God was not given. Is that word? The Spirit was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. That means the Holy Ghost was not living inside anybody. But the Spirit of God was moving all over. You know, but he was not living inside people because Jesus was not yet glorified. So when Jesus rose from the dead, the spirit was now shed forth and given. It was at that point that men could begin to function, you know, with the spirit of God on their inside. So that's why nobody was born again until Jesus rose from the dead. Because born again is a work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in. But the spirit was, you know, it was hovering. He was all over the place, walking through times walking through figures symbols to reveal the plan of god until the resurrection the moment jesus rose from the dead bam men can get born again by being born again the spirit comes in and when the spirit comes in from pentecost people began to speak in tongues so that's okay. the difference kevin pesos mba that one for you dr morphia you are next he writes dear global baba kindly throw more light on the scriptures first john 3.9. This question is because as believers, sometimes we may fall into sin, which of course we have forgiveness for. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his sperma, his seed, abideth or remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. What it means is you have a nature that does not have sin as a lifestyle. It doesn't mean you may not make mistakes. But those mistakes are not your natural habitation. 
is like a sheep that falls into mud and a pig that falls into mud. A pig in mud is at home. A sheep in mud is not at home. The sheep will start crying till you bring it out. So when a person born of God sins, you can be comfortable in sin. You can't have pleasure in it because the nature you carry, sin is not your environment. That's, it. That's what John was talking about. Okay, the last live audience question. Lord Baba, in relation to the question you asked in the first service, if anybody has been saved without receiving the Holy Spirit, kindly please explain what happened in Acts chapter 9, verse 2. Were those believers not saved before Paul laid his hands on them? It's a live question from the live audience, and this is going to be the last one I would take on this edition of the program. Can I explain what happened in Acts chapter 9, verse 2? Were those believers not saved before Paul laid his hands on them? Uh, those believers were saved because Pentecost had happened. Remember, Paul and Jesus never met. That's why Paul said, I was of one born out of due season. By this time, people were born again. By this time, they had the Holy Ghost. But Paul was persecuting them just like Boko Haram in northern Nigeria killing pastors, burning churches, and destroying churches. It's persecution for the gospel. It's not because you're not saved. It is the way the gospel operates. The gospel attracts persecution. Persecution is one of the things that the gospel attracts. And when persecution happens, when you have Christ and you know who Christ is, you have the ability to withstand persecution. Our first caller on this edition of the program. Hello. Many thanks for joining us. And where are you calling from? Good afternoon, Global Papa. Afternoon, bless you. An intercontinental Sir Michael Bush. Many thanks from Oshun State. That's your friend. Mm. This is Reverend Sam Adela. From Oshobo, Oshun State. We thank God for your life and for the program. Thank you. Papa, before my question, I want to say this in a lighter mood. Witnessing post service. Me as a pastor and my family, we always get late to church in a lighter mood. Why do you go late? <laughs> because we like eating and eating and eating and eating the word from you. By the time we get to church, we shall move with the power of God. That's right. <laughs> so bless God. Bless you. And the bless you, man of God. Whenever bless I you. teach now, my children and my family, they will say, ah, you are done with day. Dr. Abel Damina. Mm. That's right. I will say, don't worry, don't worry. You all need Christ. That's right. That's Amen. right. Amen. Amen. Now, my question is, I'm not back chapter 23, verse 23. I just want you to please help us through more life. Numbers 23. God bless you, sir. Numbers 23, 23. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, what God hath wrought. Next verse. Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lion. Okay. You know, in the time of Jacob, when all of those Jacob, J Jacob, Esau, Abraham, there was a lot of idol worship and there was a lot of enchantment and witchcraft. But because the children of Israel had a special covenant with God, because of that covenant, that covenant prevented a lot of evil things against Israel to prosper because of that covenant. So it is in the strength of that covenant that Moses was talking about the fact that no enchantment against Jacob. Remember, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, meaning a prince with God. So the position these people had with God gave them that opportunity to function in a specific level of authority by virtue of the assignment of God on their lives. So that's what he was talking about in Numbers. Okay, so Global Baba, let's run back to the continent of Australia and Oceania and try to fly straight to the UK. That is the continent of Europe. Dear Honorable General, <laughs> Global Baba, <laughs> that's, that's a new one again. That's another one for you. Honorable bring, General. They keep bringing new ones. Oh no, Global Baba. <laughs> No, Baba, I discovered you a few months ago. I love the way you do exegesis on the scriptures. Please stand with us in prayer for a fruit of the womb. I desire your mentorship program also. Furthermore, 
Please expatiate on this subject. Are there only nine spiritual gifts in the Bible? What about Ephesians 4, 8 to 12, Romans 12, 6 to 8, 1 Corinthians 12, 8 to 12? Thank you and God bless you more. David Mandy in the UK. Well, David Mandy, those gifts of the Spirit in Corinthians, where Brother Paul listed them all out, he was showing you how those offices function with the gifts. Because within those nine gifts are all the offices. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, they operate with those nine gifts. So yes, there are those nine gifts, but there are other gifts. Like giving is a gift of the Spirit. Like ruling is part of it. In the book of Romans, he talked about other gifts that can be found in the church for the edifying of the saints. Okay, so we, we make I'm, progress. I'm supposed to pray for the fruit of the womb. The womb, oh. Okay. Oh, Father, we, we pray for this family right now. We stand in faith for the fruit of the womb. Amen. And we declare that you receive that miracle. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This caller, I apologize for keeping you longer than necessary on the line, but your time starts now. Hello. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, Papa. Afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Bush. Good afternoon. Um, Lord Dumo, calling from Power City of Kobo. Okay. You know, the, the first service was so impacted. When you talked about Jesus, that is not just a name, it's an authority. Yes. And also, after that, I, was, I just started to go do a little scan on my Bible. Okay. The only place I see Je Paul, um, the apostle used the name of Jesus was when Peter told the man, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Yes. So, directly using the name. Other place was used referring to the teaching or the preaching, or the rhetoric name of Jesus in his teaching or in the teaching of the death, burial, and resurrection. Yes. Now, in prayer, I want to know, sir, how should it be used? Is it right to be every time you pray, use the name, in the name of Jesus, or can we just declare without using the name that we know that we are speaking in that authority and it will still come to pass? Thank you very much, sir. Well, again, Jesus said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Yes, so when you pray, having known the authority and that office, I mean, you are free to use, in Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Sometimes you may not use it. The important thing is that you communicate it and you have undeniable access to the Father. Okay, Global Baba, we, we need to go. We just have a little under four minutes, but let's see what happens. So from the continent of Europe, uh, we're going straight, we're coming straight to Africa. South Africa, here we come, dear Global Baba. My name is Michael Shabalala from South Africa. Thanks be to our Lord Jesus Christ for revealing God through revelation knowledge using a, a just man like you. My question is about the prophetic gift. Please, can you clarify some more? Because it's very controversial in the sense that many of them received the gifts before they are even born of God. Most of them know nothing about God. Some even starting ministry based on the gift they have, they have but no knowledge of the Bible. What kind of gift is that, Lobo Baba? Who are they working for? Thank you so much, Lobo Baba and Mr. Bush. Well, there's a gift of, uh, of, of the spirit, and there's also the gift of divination and sorcery. And sometimes the operation of sorcery and divination may look like the gifts of the spirit. Because there's a woman in Acts chapter 16 who was following Brother Paul and saying, these men are the men of the, mo of the most high who show us the way of salvation. The prophecy was accurate. But the Bible says, after two days, Brother Paul turned and said, you unclean spirit out of her. And the spirit left her, and she could no more prophesy. So, you know, that's, there's that spirit of, of, of divination. Global Baba. Yeah, we need to go, but we still can um, take this one. Um, Global Baba, my name is Emmanuel Lazarus. Doesn't tell us where he's writing from. Says, my questions are, I've heard many preachers say that rapture is, is expected to happen three years from now or not more than ten years from now. So, sir, how is this true in the light of the gospel? And, and two, what happens to the people on earth after the rapture? Leave those people alone. Leave them alone. Those are all these uh, theories, you know. Somebody, that's how somebody came out last year and said, Jesus is coming December, last December the 9th. And the people that he told did a video, and I called the people and said, on the 10th of December, we will have this discourse. Mm. So when I called them on the 10th of December, they laughed. They said, the man said that, no, that he miscalculated the calendar, mm. that it will be February. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all of those people are just doing uh, trial and error. I'm telling you, nobody has the accurate date right now. But when the time comes, we will know the time. We will know the time. We will have an understanding of the season and the time. It will not take us by surprise. But to start calculating calendar dates is out of scriptural teaching. We need to go. We need to go, Global Baba. Yeah. Well, so we're spending the night in South Africa. Yes. But we need to go. Tomorrow is another day. So on behalf of my production team and everyone, 
Mrs. Michael Busher, anchor, inviting Global Baba Dr. Abel Damina to take us home. Global Baba, we have the Intercontinental. Now listen to me, everybody. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to serve you the grace of God. You don't want to miss our broadcast right now on XLFM 1 to 3 and 3 to 5 on UNO you FM. And this evening, 8 to, um, 9 to 10 on Inspiration and, of course, 10 to 12 on uh, Excel. Heritage. Excel. Heritage Excel. FM. Tomorrow morning, 11 to 1 on Radio Aquaibom 1 to 3 on on XL, XL 3 to 5 on Unio and FM. tomorrow evening 6 to 8 we're back here live on Comfort. on Comfort FM. We love you guys and always a joy to serve you the grace of God and looking forward to seeing all of you tomorrow and until we see you tomorrow enjoy the rest of your day and be blessed. Goodbye from Uyo, Nigeria.